Okay, looks like we are live. Hello, everyone. My name is Robin Bauer Kilgo, and I am the Association Manager for ARCS. I'm only going to be online for just a few minutes just to say hello and to do some ARCS programming notes, and I'm going to hand this over to our ARCS chat hosts. Um, just so you know, upcoming for ARCS, we do have a webinar scheduled for tomorrow, actually, all about founding collections and abandoned loans. So if you're still interested in registering for that, please go to our website, arcsinfo.org. We also have a webinar scheduled for the end of the month, March 23rd, all about copyright with our Global Connections Committee. So um, if you're interested in registering for that one, again, go to our website. And finally, uh, we're going to be announcing probably in the next week or so, our next internship stipend program. It's a great program run by ARCS, which will actually help our interns earn some funds if you are enrolled in a program and have a project. So again, keep an eye on our website and um, we are looking forward to seeing what kind of applications we get from that. So, um, oh, and one quick technical note, just as everyone knows, there is a slight delay between our streaming and when we pour it out to YouTube. So just be aware of that. If you participate in the chat, which we hope you do, sign into your YouTube and Google account, um, there will be just a slight delay between when our viewers see it and when the panelists see it. So just heads up. So without further ado, I'm going to hand this over to our ARCS chat team, John Robinette and Amanda, and I hope you all enjoy the program. Talk to you soon. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to ARCS chat. I'm John Robinette. I'm a freelance collections manager based in New York, and with me as always, is Amanda Robinson coming to us from St. Petersburg, Florida. So today we are going to discuss the much discussed but never standardized topic of time-based media. So as most of you know, uh, time-based media is something that constantly changes with uh, the available technology, performers, or venues. Uh, but as collection stewards, we want to discuss how we actively protect the legacy of the artist and their intent as the works age and the technologies and personnel and the venues change. So that is the topic of today's conversation. And with us to discuss and to make light of, uh, of the situation, it's our expert panel. Joining us today is Sasha Arden, a time-based media conservator based in New York. Diego Mellado, a, the technical director for the artist studio um, at uh, for the artist Daniel Canogar. Kate Weinstein, the co collections manager and registrar for the Toma Foundation. She's based in Chicago. So to get things started, I think we have to do our uh, set some uh, some set a baseline from where to begin. And so let's start out with defining what exactly time-based media is. Uh, I'd like to um, refer to Kate first, just because she is our registrar and uh, managing a, a, an important collection of time-based media. So how do you and your collection define it, Kate? Yeah. So we actually define it a little bit different than most major museums in that we, um, time-based media is obviously any artwork, uh, any media that um, has the aspect of time. So that includes performance and audio um, and other types of time progression media. We at the Toma Foundation actually label our collection as a digital collection because we do not collect all forms of time-based media. We only collect um, forms of time-based media that include electronics and technology, um, whether it is something as simple as a motor um, or something as complex as a VR. Um, so that is, that is kind of our definition. And I do realize that our definition is a little bit different than a lot of other collections. Um, a lot of other collections do lump everything under time-based media or TBM. But we like to, we like to be different. <laughs> Sasha, as a conservator of time-based media, do you have a different definition or would you expand upon that? Yeah, I definitely think about time-based media in under as like a large tent at this moment. And uh, my interests span all of the different subheadings that Kate just mentioned. Um, my practice is very heavily influenced by all of those areas as well. I'm currently doing research in VR, but I'm pulling from performance preservation theory and um, experience and um, interaction theory. So 
I think that at the moment it's a lot, it's a bit overwhelming <clears throat> to define things so broadly, but it's also a very rich environment. And Diego, since you are working with an artist who is known for their time-based media installations, I guess we'll call it time-based media. Uh, would how, Do you see it uh, similarly or do you have a, a, another take on it as well? No, I, I do agree with the, with the rest of us. Uh, I think that TVM, like time-based media, is very wide. Probably what we do is more related to electronic media, software-based media, database media. So it's a little bit like a, a little niche inside of all those uh, different medias that time-based media includes. No? Yeah, sometimes we've been defined as media art, like new media, which is not exactly the kind of la label that I like the most because I think it's more related to a very specific time, like a period of time, something between the 70s and the 90s. Um, but yeah, as Sasha was seeing it, saying, it's very, very difficult to, to get just one label that includes what we all do, which is pretty similar. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, directly related to that, and I think the, the real jumping off point for this conversation is the idea of intent. And, um, you know, I, on some level, do we need to define time-based media in order to understand the, uh, the intent of the work? And maybe that just depends on the work, right? But like, uh, um, Diego, sticking with you, like, do you, um, how do you, uh, how do you, this is something I've been struggling with the whole time is, is making this uh, declaration. How do you, how do you preserve uh, the intent of the work um, knowing that, um, that the technology that you use now is going to change? Yeah, well, I think that the first thing would be defining which is the intention. I mean, intention could be a very different things and that would depend a lot on the artist, that can also depend on the institution. Different institutions can have different intentions and can overcome conservation of the same piece on different ways, all of them right, if they're properly stated, depending on whether their intention. In the case of the studio, right now, our main intention is keep things working. So if, because we want to, the artworks to be experienced, and we want, I mean, we don't want to pay too much attention to some things that could change. So something that we try to do, and mostly we do it over documentation, the documentations that we um, deliver with the artwork is define what the artwork is and what the artwork is not. I mean, there is this uh, kind of common uh, important point about what are the, um, defining characteristics of the artwork. I think Sasha may know a little bit more about that, but what we try to do is to state those clearly. Um, I don't know how successful we are because there are always these things that you're not able to think, like how people will think about this part of the artwork in 50 or 70 um, years from now. But what we really try to do is to make the artwork as independent as possible from the hardware, considering that there, were, there will there will always be a better hardware solution that, that right now we have something that hardware-wise, software-wise could be emulated or could be um, substituted in the future. So basically that, I mean, paying very much attention to the concept, define the concept inside of the algorithm or relate concept and algorithm and try to make all that as independent of the hardware as we can. Sometimes we can, sometimes we make it better, so, um, sometimes it's worse. But yeah, trying to, to give a good definition of what the artwork is and what the artwork is not. Yeah, I, I imagine, Sasha, if, if, um, if a piece comes across your desk, um, this, is, this is a lot, this is the distinction that you're trying to make in order to restore it, right? Like how integral is the hardware to the intent, right? Right. And uh, I'm you sitting here kind of chuckling to myself about Diego saying the artist wants to define what the artwork is, because I feel like that's sometimes 99 percent of what we as conservators do when an artwork <laughs> comes to us or when we're revisiting an artwork after many years is wh what what is the artwork anyway? Is it the <laughs> hardware? Is it if there's a software component or digital assets? Are there material components? What is, 
replaceable and what is not and kind of what carries the artwork forward? Where do we need to place our focus? And intent is an element of that, but often we're, you know, kind of trying to look holistically at um, what we've received and then also the artist's larger um, body of work to put it in context, the time of the work to put it in context. And it's, yeah, it, you quickly get into the weeds of just uh, trying to take the first step um, into actual conservation treatment. Right. I imagine you, a lot of this, you have to do this work to even determine if repairing the hardware is necessary, right? Right, right. Um, I mean, an obvious example would be like a CRT display. Maybe that was just what was available at the time, and it doesn't really matter what kind of display the um, visuals go on to as long as they are still of good quality um, and not distorted in any way by a new display. Sometimes it's just an inherent part of that artwork that it needs to be on a CRT display. I mean, you could extrapolate that to any piece of hardware really um, right. that I've come across. Yeah, yeah. Now, Kate, I mean, managing a collection, now I know that you're specific to, to digital works, but like managing a collection um, of, of time-based media, uh, how do you, at the point of uh, acquisition, how are you um, documenting and integrating these, these ideas and, and, and this idea of intent uh, in, in your, I, I mean, from a collections management point of view. And then uh, the broader question uh, to sort of follow up with that would be is how is managing a TBM collection different than managing say a, a traditional art collection or maybe a history or science collection? So yeah. Yeah, two parts. Yeah, of course. Um, so to answer the first part, um, I think one of the things that we have learned over the years, um, our first, acquisition into time-based media or digital art was in 2011. Um, so it's been about 10 years now. And up until about 2016, 2017, we really wanted and tried to force uh, the works to be a static collection and that you purchase it and it is what it is and it just will run forever. The same way a painting would be on a wall as long as the environment is correct, right? Um, and we have done a complete 180 in the last, you know, five years in that understanding that the work itself, every single work, it, there's no formula that you can apply that will work with every single piece. Um, there's no preservation plan that you can apply that will work with every single piece. And more than that, every, um, the entire collection is very dynamic in the sense that, um, we're constantly having to adjust our policies and procedures and how we think about the collection um, every time we add a new artwork, because every new artwork introduces new technologies, um, new types of hardware and um, new intentions even from the artist. Um, and that includes not just new works that are being made now, but also historic works that we have collected where um, we might have an artist that, you know, created this work in 1992 and in 1998 had revisited it for a retrospective and had changed what they thought the intention of the art was and what they wanted out of the artwork. And then in 2005 have done another retrospective and have changed the intentions once again and what they expect and then now have done that as well. That, all, that also includes artists that were very limited by the technology of their time. So the intention of the work was always much larger than what they could physically do at the time. And now that technology has caught up a little bit more, what they expect and how they expect the artwork to function has changed because there, there, there are not as many constraints to the idea that they had originally. So that makes my job, um, just a little bit more um, time intensive, I would say, um, for this collection compared to the other areas that we collect. So I think a really great um, thing, I'm just gonna give you an example. So we also collect art of the Spanish Americas, which are paintings 
created in um, the Viceroyalty of Peru from like the 1600s through the 1800s. So these paintings have existed for over 300 years and other than conservation or restoration interventions throughout time um, and environmental interventions throughout time, these have primarily saved, stayed the same for the most part. But we have artworks that we collected in 2012 um, that we've had to have completely rebuilt <laughs> and they've been, they're less than 10 years old. And it's because one of the biggest thing that we have to think about is not just the artist's intention and not just like what it's on at this time and maybe changes of technology, but also the majority of these artworks are being made with consumer based products that have planned obsolescence in the heart that like built into what it's made out of. And so our workaround for that or kind of the way that we think that we can preserve and be proactive in our preservation is documentation. And that's what it all circles back to because we know that what these are made of physically will not last forever. No matter what the artist's intention is, this hardware will not last forever. Eventually it is going to fail. And because of planned obsolescence and advancing technologies, eventually what it's on will no longer be available. You, you can't do a one-to-one -one swap eventually. You, you just can't, you know? Like name, like, you know, you can't get a, even like an iPod or iPod shuffle. Like <laughs> when was the last time you saw one of those in the streets, you know? Um, yeah. So Canal what street. we do is not just document the intention, but we document the hardware and what's important about the hardware. Is it just structural? Is it just what it's able to do computing wise? Is it aesthetic? And just like what Sasha had mentioned, you know, is the CRT integral to the way it looks and what it was supposed to be? Or is it just because CRT was the type of TV that was available now then? And, you know, and, and on top of that, like if you're just talking about monitors, is it 4.3, is that important? Or was it 4.3 because that's what all TVs were and you can do it on a 16.9 monitor, you know? And then even with that, another thing that we try to look at proactively is even if that's not the artist's intention, like maybe the monitor, like the way it's displayed is not um, vitally important to the intention, of the artist, we also look at how it can be um, kind of accepted and viewed by the by the audience, mm -hmm. right? So if we take a 1980s video and it doesn't matter to the artist if it's on a 4.3 or on a 16.9, if we put it on a 16.9 and we have black bars, like how is that gonna present itself to the audience? And is that something that they're gonna have a layer of separation that we don't want because the distraction of the black bars? You know, maybe maybe we put it on a flat monitor still, but we um, we did a 4.3 monitor. We get a custom 4.3 monitor. Or maybe because it doesn't matter and we can't get a 4.3 monitor, maybe we only project it, you know? And kind of looking at all of those options for us. And the thing that is the most time intensive is actually documenting all of those options, right? Here are all the options for display. Here is what we think the artist's intention, but this is also how we view it as a viewer um, in our own separate. So one of the fields that we use in documenting that is a narrative-based behavior summary. Mm -hmm. uh, this is what, like, if I was to come up on this in the museum or in the space, what would I experience as the viewer? Right. And then separately, we document the technological aspects, which really um, indicate like what the artist was intending as well, like why this hardware is important, how it functions, how it talks to itself. And all of that gets documented in the hopes that 10, 15, 30 years from now, when a conservator like Sasha comes around, they are not reinventing the wheel of like, what was the artist thinking 30 years ago? What was the viewer thinking 30 years ago when it was new and functioning exactly how, I guess what I wanna say is like when the art, artwork is new, that is when you have the least distance between the artist's intention and the viewer's interpretation. Yeah. And trying to document that as soon as possible gives us the best opportunity in the future to be able to preserve that experience.
Yeah. That was a very I mean, long answer. <laughs> no, no, no. I get it. And, uh, I mean, in, in a way, um, it's, and I imagine, you know, I, Diego and Sasha will have a lot to say about this, but um, it sounds kind of subjective in the sense that if you're, you're trying to interpret in some cases, if the intent changes or if the, the, the medium, if you will, changes, it, it goes from a slide projector to a video projector to uh, a virtual reality, you're trying to interpret what the common thread is between there, if, if you don't have access to the artist or the estate. But uh, I mean, Diego, I imagine that that is exactly what you do not want, right? Is for someone else to interpret the work and, and, and well, I, I, I was that. finding Kate's point of view very interesting because she was mentioning all these different technologies that is very difficult to understand if they were important or not. And especially they're very difficult to understand from our temporal perspective. Um, for example, um, right now there is a lot of a lot going on trying to restore flash artworks because flash died. And so I was doing with a um, conservation friend in Mexico, um, Ana Lizet, Lizet. We were doing some um, interviews with artists, asking them, what is the actual value of flash in this artwork? And most of them were saying, yeah, it was just the tool that I could use. It was the tool that I knew how to use. At that time, programming wasn't that spread. Flash made it easy, so why not? So the actual conclusion is that it could be flash it could have been any other thing but from the historical point of view flash allowed them to start working into that direction so historically flash has a value that we can understand now some 15 20 years later and for me it's also important to understand which is the intention of the institution that is collecting that work because it could be as kate was saying uh reproducing the um uh, visitor experience, but some um, curator would like to do an uh, exhibition on why Flash was important in the 90s. And then suddenly Flash has a completely different understanding and a different meaning, excuse me. And both perspectives are fine. I mean, my background is on engineering. The thing that I like the most is take something and move it to a different technology, try to understand it, go plug and plug cables. That's the thing that I like most. But I need to understand that that perspective, that super technical perspective, may be good for me, but not for the rest of the stakeholders. And in that sense, I cannot, I cannot highlight how, um, how important documentation is. Even if it's not the most fanciest thing, even though it takes a lot of resources, I mean, every single time that we have to do a manual in the studio, it takes forever. And you have to gather a lot of information. You have to think about things that could happen, that could not draw diagrams. It's, it's very time consuming. And especially from the artist's studio point of view, it's like, well, we should be doing art. Shall we be doing the documentation? Is this something that should be done by some other stakeholder? Um, I will show, but as, as Kate was saying, uh, every single piece means a different technology. So we can't yeah. expect that uh, institutions get experts on everything. So about interpretation, which was the, the thing that you were asking at the very beginning? Of course, I would prefer that nobody makes interpretations, but depending on the environment or depending on the circumstances, those interpreta interpretations may be useful because yeah. maybe the artworks that we are producing right now are to be seen on a very different uh, with a different, very different scope or with the very different glasses in the future. And that's something that we can control. Something yeah. that, that we try to understand in the studio is that the moment that you present an artwork is not ours anymore, is part of something else, a collection, uh, well, cultural heritage, hopefully, at some yeah. point. And then there is some control that that is to be lost. Yeah. Um... All right, Amanda, um, what's going on in the chat? Any questions for our panel? Yeah, it's gotten a little active. I think this is a question that might um, pop back to Kate. One of our listeners asked, if we look at software-based art, when something like a code update is needed to keep a piece running, how does that get documented? How would this new creation of the new code writing be acknowledged? So um, Sasha will also have 
I think some strong opinions about this, um, but it completely depends on the artwork. And I feel like that's going to be my answer every single time. Um, it, can it depends on the artwork. So for some artworks where the um, there, where there's third party dependencies, whether it's um, another internet function or some other piece of hardware, um, if the code has to be updated for it to work, um, I can give you two examples. One, um, we would document that code change as a conservation treatment um, and be able to note that in our registrarial records as a treatment. And then uh, the conservator would write a report, hopefully, that would outline the changes into the code and then also comment into the code itself the changes that they have made. That is if it's a static change, maybe um, it needs a driver update or something like that that's very easily documented or a graphics card update or something like that. But when we have third party dependencies where the artwork is connecting to the internet and is maybe pulling a Twitter feed or um, or as Diego knows, when a can of ours work um, goes directly to a CNN live video feed, um, those are harder because they have to be updated more often um, because as the third party um, and as you know, we don't, the artist has no control over CNN and the way that they display their videos on the internet. Um, and so when those code things change, um, uh, we leave it up to the artist on whether or not they deem it something that should be commented out um, or not, and if it should be determined as considered a conservation um, treatment. Um, on that note, we also have some other artworks that still talk to the artist server. Um, and so the artist can get in there and change the code whenever they want. And we would not know um, unless they decided to tell us. And in that case, that, that documentation is impossible to, to maintain on our end, um, unless we happen to catch something you know, and ask for that to be documented. So there's kind of the three levels of complete control, partial control, and no control at all. Um, and the documentation goes hand in hand with that. Sasha, do you have something else to add on that from a conservator's perspective? Yeah, I, I would definitely, um, I mean, the first thing that came to mind was the methodologies that have been established through um, research projects and treatment projects, case studies through um, initiatives like the computer, the like conservation of computer-based arts, um, uh, collaboration between the Guggenheim and MoMA and NYU in the computer sciences program um, run by Dina Engel, Joanna, um, um, Joanna Phillips and Glenn Wharton. Um, I think that's on pause until some things kind of get glued together again, but they did a lot of important work to um, actually establish this methodology of commenting in conservator code directly into um, the code, really saying who did, who did this, why it was done um, so that it's legible in the artwork itself. Um, and I would add that sometimes um, there are cases that are more extreme, like we can't even rely on the code necessarily. Let's just stick with uh, the case of Flash that Diego brought up. Um, you know, we, we need to kind of do serious intervention one way or another in order to see Flash itself. Um, we would need to use an emulator. We would need to use at this point, legacy um, hardware and browsers, if we wanted to not use an emulation environment um, or undertake a migration project, which would be mm -hmm. basically reconstructing the, the artwork with new technologies to do the same things. And really um, in that case, you know, there, <laughs> there are a lot of questions around intent and kind of maybe um, there are multiple ways to end up at the same product of recreating the artwork with the same behaviors. I mean, I did a, a prototyping project with um, Lynn Hirschman's Agent Ruby, which uses Flash. And I came up with probably six different ways using different current technologies to do the same thing. But not all of them maintained the kind of conceptual integrity of the artwork. And we needed to go back to the artist to talk with her about, you know, what, what actually is in line with how this artwork 
is enacted and, and how you imagine it to be, you know, is, can we encapsulate it in a video? Can we use, um, like, does it have to be code that's enacted at the moment that the uh, viewer is interacting with this website? Or could it be even like almost a, a video recreation where we're just snapshotting elements of the original animation and then serving that through a browser? You know, that it really kind of, you have to pick apart the nuances to figure out where, where authenticity lies. Our, That's interesting. My, oh, sorry, oh, sorry John, go ahead. Okay, so there was another follow up question from one of our listeners that asked, would you consider that? Because um, Kate said, well, this would be thought of as a conservation treatment for a piece. But when you're doing something quite extensive like that, would that be considered a new version of the same work when it migrates to a different type of presentation like that? Yeah, it, 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 there are varying answers to this question. And again, here's our trope, it depends. Um, sometimes it depends on the artist and whether they consider it a new version of the work um, or a new, just a different iteration over time. It depends on, um, if you're in an institutional setting, it depends on the curator and kind of policies around that. So um, I think in many cases, there is a new date put on for kind of complete reconstructions. Um, I'm thinking about Hans Hacke's news where the original version in 1969 was using just a completely different set of hardware and technologies to present um, current news feeds to a uh, gallery audience to 2008 when we're using RSS feeds and um, dot matrix printers that never existed in 1969. So um, yeah, it's it's up to interpretation and, and sometimes politics and policies. Are there any more uh, questions from the chat? There are, they actually, the other few that have popped in kind of speak a little bit to um, not specifically artist intent, but kind of managing the relationships with artists to, at least maybe from an institutional perspective um, on how to ensure that intent um, is maintained as well as some general questions about new acquisitions uh, that are time-based media and uh, copyright, getting permission from artists if you want to change formatting. We can talk a little bit about that if you're interested. Yeah, I can jump in and just, you know, of course there are also um, legal ramifications of, of artist intent. You know, if, if a collector or a museum um, does something to restore an artwork and the artist or their estate um, decides that that is not uh, in line with the artist's intent, then there can be consequences for that. Um, so that's a, a great observation and definitely part of the, <laughs> the rubric of decision making. Um, I I lost my train of thought on the other things that were in that question. There's there's so much to to speak to. I've gotten overwhelmed. <laughs> Sorry. Well, and then maybe Diego has some feelings about this. Uh, or has some opinions about this as well um, in terms of like managing the relationships with artists to ensure that in, their intent is upheld um, in the long-term care of a work and how to go about kind of developing those relationships and, and making sure that they they last. I mean, I'm always thinking about when artists are no longer with us and we don't have, you know, we don't have that luxury of being able to go to them and say, well, what do you need here? What is your, what is your intent here? Thinking more so about down the line when they aren't there to be able to answer those types of questions so explicitly. Luckily, we haven't been in that situation yet. Otherwise, I wouldn't have a job anymore. So let's cross fingers and hope that <laughs> that lasts a little bit. Um, I mean, I was always saying in the introduction, for us, we try to, de to deliver as much information as possible. And again, we know that there are some things that are going to be out of our control. That said, every single time an artwork from the studio is being installed and it's not installed in the regular um, conditions that it will be expected, like with the screen that was purchased or delivered, with the computer that it was used, we, um, we try as much as possible to, use, um, how do you say, to test and to be sure that they are using the right hardware. 
Um, documentation wise, what we really, really try to do specifically in these data works, like the one that Kate was um, commenting before, there is this um, artwork that um, retrieves videos from CNN, is to specifically state what is the algorithm, what it has to do. And the way that we do that is different ways. We, we of course, deliver the source code, but the source code is dependent on a lot of things, even the, the, the language itself. Source code is an implementation of the algorithm on a specific programming language. So together with the source code, we also deliver um, these flowcharts and system diagrams to try to describe the artwork in, in technical means. So what we consider and we hope is that uh, people with the right training, like programmers, having the source code together with um, the flowchart and the description of the algorithm should be enough to recreate or reconstruct the artwork. Um, as Kate was saying, there are these things that we cannot control. It's like, what will happen with CNN in the future? What will happen with YouTube or with all the data sources that we use? So what we do is that we integrate inside of the algorithm. We, we try to work with this idea of conservation from production. When we produce our artworks, we try to keep in the back of our hands how the conservation of this artwork could be easier, or even impossible. So especially when, when we go into this um, database artworks, what we do is that we integrate a copy of the data that we use. Every time a CNN video appears, we keep a copy um, inside of the hard drive. Every time we grab the wind speed, wind, wind speed on a location, we keep that data. So if at any point the internet connection is down, I mean, because the Wi-Fi is not working or because the API is not working anymore or because, I don't know, YouTube decides to cut its stream forever. There is always something that the algorithm can, can grasp. And um, the nice thing or the thing that we like a lot about that is that for the algorithm, it's the same thing. It's data with the same shape. The only difference is that it's not being retrieved live. And considering intention and considering significant properties, that's very important because the artwork was conceived as something that was retrieving information live, and it's not anymore. So in that sense, we consider that the artwork is not the artwork anymore, but then it's shifted to something different. And we kind of play with this idea of taking something, taking data from the past, represents how the artwork should have been seen in the past and what is documentation if not how the artwork used to be on a very specific moment right um so in that moment in the in, the, in those situations we consider that the artwork is not the artwork but it's documentation of itself um so it's kind of the closest that you can be to the actual artwork but it's not the artwork anymore we have to be um, open to losing that quality of the artwork this, I hope that. Yeah, uh, no, this is uh, a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I uh, the, it gets it gets uh, sticky really fast there. Um, I I think that uh, I had a follow up question. I totally blanked on it. <laughs> it was um, the um, I mean I think that I, I was just thinking like your your solution there to having a copy of what it was in the past seems to suggest that whatever the follows CNN is not say, say there's another form of news or another platform um, that we don't, that we haven't come up with say in a hundred years, CNN doesn't exist anymore. You, you have made that decision. And this is an important point of documentation to use what CNN was in the past. It's sort of the same thing of, you know, deciding that the CRT is the type of monitor that has to be used for this and not just the latest type of projecting device, um, right? Is, is that an analogous situation? I, I think it does, but that, that opens a lot of interesting questions for the future. For example, for example, we have this other artwork that used YouTube videos as a palette. You, know, you look for a um, query and then you have the little 100 most view most view videos and we do this kind of oily oily painting and something that daniel stated from the very beginning is that it has to be youtube it cannot be email it cannot be any other one it has to be youtube because youtube is some kind of the new 
uh, Alexandria library of the present time. Mm. That's how we understand YouTube now. What if in the future, in 15 years time, the only thing that you can find in YouTube is videos from cats? I don't know. <laughs> then the other we talk of what YouTube is at that moment, not at what YouTube was at the moment that the artwork was conceived. In the very same way, CRT monitors are the way of watching television at home, for example, just to put one, one label on that. But right now, it's something very difficult to deal with that broke easily. So, yeah. <laughs> conceptually, it has changed a lot. And also the way that we see those artworks change dramatically. I mean, when we see a network of Nanjun Pike with a CRT monitor, we can only, I mean, I can only have this kind of uh, nostalgia because I got to know those CRT um, monitors when I was a kid and this and that for a um, uh, millennial could be something completely different. So even though this is not the kind of answer that people like because solves problems, we have to be open to different interpretations of things that we take for granted right now. Kate and Sasha, you, uh, oh, sorry, Sasha, you have a, a point to make on that? Yeah, Kate, did you have something to say? Yeah, I was actually gonna yeah. bring up that Diego brings up a really interesting point and something that we think about as collectors too, especially since we um, exhibit all of the works is, um, kind of the differentiation of like level of deadness <laughs> of an artwork. Um, so, um, you know, if you don't display the work in the way that it's intended to be made and intended to be displayed, like the artist can say like, this is not an actual artwork anymore. But Diego and Studio Kanagar have come up with this kind of intervention that allows for technological failure on the part of the exhibitor. <laughs> Um, where the Wi-Fi might be dead or the internet connection goes in and out or it's unreliable, but the artwork is still alive, right? And so that's one of the things that we document because we don't really consider that, like on our end, we don't really consider that as something that is documenting the way that it did exist at that point because we know the internet connection will come back, right? And then it will go back to the live feed. What it's doing is it's, it's removing a blank screen or an interruption of the experience for the viewer. It's removing that at that point. But as you said, like once CNN no longer exists or once whatever no longer exists, then, then the artwork, its entire intent and function changes as almost like a documentation, like the same, we would think about it the same way that we would think about documenting a performance, right? It becomes a legacy artwork that documented the way that we experienced it at the time that no longer exists. And so I think that's actually a really interesting thing because um, out of our collection, um, Studio Kanagar, you guys are the only ones that are doing something like that. Um, you and Sebrin Bierstieg, he also has a backup in case things go down. But a lot of the art that we have, if the internet is not working, the artwork goes dead, you know? And so that's an interruption to the viewer itself, um, which causes um, quite a few frantic phone calls from our borrowers. <laughs> at any hey, given hour. That, is that something that you request uh, when, when you purchase a piece, when you acquire something? You don't we ask do, if there's a dead not, version? Yeah, we do not do that. We we like to follow what the artist wants, you know, yeah. and if they want to have a fail safe in that, then they're welcome to do it. But it's not something that we request. Um, and it's actually something that in the past, um, not necessarily with Studio Kanagar, but in the past that has raised issues with us because we have purchased something and we couldn't tell if it was working or not actually, or if it was only relying on the fail safe. And that, um, that just causes like another layer of what we need to do on our end to understand the work, to know like, is this, is this functioning or not? And we even had one artwork with one artist where our founder wanted them to like put a little thing up so he would know that it wasn't <laughs> wasn't live um and we, it was a discussion nope nope because then that you know then that's not the same artwork right if you know it's not working then that removes the whole reason why that existed in the first place um i also wanted to go 
back um, very quickly to Amanda's tail end of her question of like legal um, information on like having the ability to migrate. So when we do our bills of sale for any purchases that we make um, or anything that we are gifted, we actually write into the language that we are able to make copies of the artwork for preservation purposes and that we are able to migrate them into the future. Um, and we just kind of give ourselves carte blanche with that, because um, obviously we want the best terms as possible legally <laughs> on our end with our contracts, but that ends up being a point of negotiation with the artist on whether or not they accept that or not, or if there's um, partial restrictions. And it actually ends up being like a really nice conversation most of the time um, with either the artist studio or the representative explaining our intentions to the work. Um, because we're something that is a little bit of an institution and a little bit of a private collector, um, I think there's a lot of times some hesitation from artists and no understanding the level of preservation that we expect out of our own collection and the, the methodology that we would use to follow best practices versus us just kind of banging around in the artwork and doing whatever we want. And um, it allows us to deepen the conversations about intent and what the artist expects for its longevity of the artwork's life um, and having that just written in our contract even. Um, and, you know, some artists say absolutely not. And then we abide by that, you know, but we, we always ask and uh, assume, I guess we always assume that we would have that ability to be able to keep the artwork alive once it enters our collection. Um, and then we go from there. Yeah, this is a, it's a really, this is a really interesting time, I think, because, um, uh, there's so many, I guess we're kind of transitioning from a more, um, from a moment in time-based media um, production and conservation and, and exhibition where we're, you know, artists are just making stuff and showing it and it's coming into collections. And then um, as it's re-exhibited, we have to figure out how to make that happen. And kind of um, in a moment of transition from, I guess, scrambling to make it work and do justice to the artworks and the artists to knowing what we need to do to get ahead of the works. Um, and on top of that, I think the kind of roles um, around the artwork are really becoming more blurry. I mean, um, Diego is a great example of being a producer, but also kind of also has a foot in conservation, thinking about how to keep the work running and, you know, has written brilliantly about all of the considerations around that. Um, people like Mark Heller in a similar role, who is a, a producer, a technologist and a conservator, you know, by different turns. Um, and, you know, it's it's a very highly collaborative environment where we're all kind of putting our um, um, our energies toward hopefully the same thing, which is which is to maintain the work in some way. Um, and really for, for me, like as a conservator, it's a really interesting thing to kind of step back and understand my role is not necessarily being an intervener, but, but really being a steward, kind of gathering all of the necessary forces and um, keeping a, lo a longer time period perspective on, okay, if we make this decision now, what does that mean down the road? Um, when things are coming in through the door, you know, what, just keeping track of what we're going, what we're going to need and establishing relationships that we will need to lean on in the future. Um, so I'm really just really looking forward to like how all of this will keep evolving, how our roles will keep changing and how, um, you know, kind of the success of keeping artworks alive is, is going to also evolve. So I should most make me blush. Sorry for, for inter interrupting. Um, I, I wanted to add on what Sasha was saying. Uh, I think that you now, conservators, are also team leaders. I mean, the fact that now producers are being part of the conservation of the conservation conser conversation is uh, because we have some kind of knowledge that other people don't. 
and that knowledge allows us to give more information but we should know what is what you need i should be a tool so to say inside of the conservation project because you sasha know what conservation is i i tried to get a little bit into conservation and i could understand that it's a completely different way of thinking than mine that i just want things working <laughs> uh, but maybe that's not the solution so you guys may not know how to compile a C++ program, but know why using C++ could be or could not be important and may have a conversation with the rest of the team or the rest of the stakeholders and decide which is the best way to uh, proceed with this intervention, considering that our goals are A, B, C, and D and have that, that kind of um, conversation clearly stated. So you guys are the ones to lead the conversation in some sense, because you are the ones that are going to have to study why artists were choosing one tools over the others in 15 years or something. So I, I, I really see the conservation practitioners uh, as the, the team leaders of this kind of, of interventions. Um, so Diego, you took all the words right out of my mouth because <laughs> I was just going to say like one of the things that I really love about time-based media and kind of my role here is exactly what you said. It's like we're taking guide, like as a registrar and collection, we're taking guidance from the conservators to see where I can supplement my expertise and knowledge to make their lives easier in the long run and knowing that, um, that it is not always the same for more traditional media. You know, a lot of the registrar work becomes very siloed from what the conservator is doing or what the collection manager is doing sometimes where you can't do that with time-based media. Like the work cannot exist if you silo your work from your colleagues or from other experts. Um, and, and even paintings, you know, you can step you shouldn't, but with contemporary artists, you could step away from the artist once the painting is done and never contact them again about their work if you don't want to. You know, you cannot do that with time-based media. You can't because even us, um, you know, as, as we're preparing for preservation or as we readdress a work that's no longer functioning, you know, we as as exhibitors may panic and call us about something not working we may then turn around and panic and call the artist um immediately because we don't have an answer off the top of our hat of like how to fix this thing to get it to work you know and and it means that the relationships that you have with everybody are incredibly vital um and it means that honestly that you all have like we all have to play nice with each other which just makes it a little bit and that collaboration is nice i guess is what i'm saying and because you we need each other you were forced to be kind to each other <laughs> and you know makes the world a better place so there we go <laughs> thanks relationship conservation there um <laughs> The um, so uh, we have about uh, 10 minutes left here, and I want to make sure that we uh, get back to the chat and see if there's any other questions from our listeners. Amanda, what's going on over there? Well, there was actually a specific question for Diego, and I think we're, we're kind of skirting like skirting around it now. But um, the ask was if there is a question that collectors or institutions don't usually ask when acquiring a new time based media work from the studio that you think they really should be proactively asking. No, I mean, I can't think of any. Um, sometimes um, there are some things that we need to explain them or that it's, it doesn't come directly out of, of the head. Um, also, something that I have been um, watching lately is like almost every institution, they have their own uh, questionnaire, is the right word? And, and you take them and you can see how different institutions give more importance to any other thing uh, instead of having one single questionnaire which on the other hand would be impossible not only because institutions may like or dislike different things also because as we were speaking during the late hour the last hours every single uh, work is different from one to the other something that we try to push but we cannot uh, kind of, uh, of force anybody to do is to give us um, always an internet connection to the computer that we are using 
even if it's not grabbing data from the internet, because that allows us to remote access the computer and do remote diagnosis. I mean, I, I would love to be able to travel time and space immediately, but it could happen that I need to watch a work on Santa Fe and at the same time another one in Milano. And, and having those kind of resources is, is, is really, really useful. Um, something that, uh, that maybe could be different in some way is that you, when you have been working in this field for a little and doing some research, you can see that there are like different trends, all of them going in the right direction, but different trends. Now, during some time, it was uh, emulation uh, or, or the other way. It was first about source code, then emulation. And it's like, yes, those are super powerful tools. Right now, I could say that emulation is probably the, the most power tool that you can use to have uh, like old artwork. Um, Sasha was using the word legacy, legacy hardware and legacy um, works, but that on its own, it's not enough and, and it will change. So I can see a lot of collectors right now demanding from us the source code. It's like, okay, I'm going to give you the source code. I'm going to give you the programming environment and the drivers or whatever you want. But at some point, some of these things will need to change. None of those are absolute solutions. So also something that has improved a lot in the last 10 years is the knowledge inside of the institutions. And now you can, institutions are collectors, both of them. And now you can see that they're asking the right questions and they're pointing some, to some places. And so coming back to what Kate was saying before, community is super important and sharing knowledge. Uh, one of the reasons why we are taking conservation so seriously in the in the studios because we feel that demand from institutions from collectors we can share that knowledge with some friends with some other studios so the thing is that the questions that could be important maybe we are not even asking the, those at uh, this very moment so keeping that community and sharing that knowledge is probably the the most powerful tool for time-based media conservation I... sasha Sorry, go ahead, Kate. I was, oh, I, I was just going to quickly tag in um, yeah. what Studio Kanekar was doing as far as having the remote access to the artwork. Um, studio um, for the for Rafael Lozano Hammer was doing the same, and it was actually their their implementation of that. That's now part of our acquisition procedure is to ask for that for software based works if the artist isn't already providing it. And so like, that's a great example of the way that it's pushed and pulled from all directions of us all kind of figuring things out and changing our policies accordingly. Sasha, I wanted to sort of rephrase the, the question, but back at you from a conservator's point of view, is there a question that constantly comes up that you wish you had answered, say from the artist's perspective, whether it's about intent or what have you? Well, I mean, I... I... No, there's no single question that yeah. applies to everything. But it, and and my comment around that is is more about um, kind of focusing on the artist questionnaire. It is kind of I see it as a, maybe a necessary evil. It's never going to um, ask all the perfect questions for each artwork, and sometimes um, it sometimes a questionnaire can really miss the mark. And um, I can think of many instances where an artist has returned a questionnaire with, you know, it, <laughs> the means by which one can like be kind of sassy in it mm -hmm. and just give, you know, one word answers or not really answer the questions. And, and it's clear that these questions are not doing justice to the work in some way. Um, and it, it, it's just, it, it can be a little bit deflating from a conservator's point of view, because we do want to have this information documented. And I would really love to try to move away from this kind of traditional conception of, of thinking about intent as a tap that one can turn on and just collect. Like it's static, it's there. It, it obviously existed at one point. Here we can put it in a document and we've got it. Um, but it, again, it's like, I really want uh, any kind of exchanges with an artist um, or a producer, anyone who's involved with an artwork who can enlighten us 
to be um, trusting and productive. So uh, as we're just learning about an artwork, it, it we also have to communicate our intent um, to try to be on the same page and not just stuff this artwork into a, a convenient box so that we can work with it in our own way. <laughs> That is a, such a great point there is to that intent worth works both ways. And um, I, I think that's so good um, for the last little section uh, of segment of this uh, discussion. I want to talk about uh, resources, if you don't mind sticking around for another, say, five minutes. Um, you know, since the common theme for this discussion is it depends, um, you know, everything is a variable. How do we, what are the resources that we can use um, that we can refer to, to, um, to document the, the collections, document the, the, the pieces? Are there any, say, manuals uh, besides, you know, the materials provided by an artist or, that, or a questionnaire that you, that you use? Um, where, where do you go for your information? I can start. Um, so the Guggenheim has a series of blog posts that are incredibly helpful um, on the work that they did with their computer, Sasha, correct me, it's computer-based artwork initiative or conservation, something like that. Like CCBA, I think is what it might be called. Conservation um, of computer-based artwork. Uh, yeah, computer -based and artworks, so, yeah. yeah, so they have a series of blog posts that were incredibly helpful. There's also Media Matters, um, they have a, quite a few documents. Um, the uh, American Association, the American Institute for Conservation also has started to put together like a time-based media wiki um, and they have ones. Um, and honestly, the, the place, I, I spent about a year on a fact-finding mission before we started updating our policies. And the things that were the most valuable for me were actually talking to other people in the field, um, whether it was artists, or um, conservators at larger institutions, SFMOMA, MOMA, um, Guggenheim, MET, um, Whitney, like all of the big names that have kind of been leading the, the charge here in the United States. Um, what else? There's also like the digital standards um, that were developed as part of the library science um, um, people and uh, oh God, there's so many. I can actually, why don't I actually open up something and I can pop it into the chat for ARCS to share of like a list of resources that I always like to share. And then the last thing I will say is I will also share all of our documents that we've created here um, um, so that it can be useful. And I did an ARCS presentation earlier this year and also shared those documents. So I think ARCS may have them um, as part of the ARCS conference. Um, yeah, we'll make it available again, but we'll put links on our description of the show and in the podcast as well. So, um, Sasha, you're you're finishing up a a, a degree. Uh, anything that you can recommend? Well, I I'm I mean I would add to Kate's robust list that also um, Tate and the Met and Smithsonian also have great published um, documentation resources, and. Um, I don't want to put words into Kate's mouth, but I just want to say, like, I have also learned from you that not that not every approach works for every institution. Um, so we may be informed by uh, the resources that have been able to be produced by a, a big institution, but um, you don't have to feel like, uh, I guess it's just it's not it's not always reasonable to hit every single level of documentation. It, it may just not be feasible, and you may in fact be failing to do collections management properly if you try to do that because you're just spread too thin. So it it really is about knowing knowing your collection, knowing your capacity, and um, trying to determine you know what are the most important things about the artwork that you can take care of. Diego, any last thoughts about uh, trying to standardize an unstandardizable tra practice? <laughs> well, I think that trying to make it the standard is going to be impossible and because everything depends, as, as we were saying. I can't add to anything to what Kay just put on the chat. I will try to gather some information too, but community, 
I mean, yeah. uh, when I started dealing with these kind of things, which was some six, seven years ago, I was just email bombing every single person that I could find. Mm-hmm. And every single one was answering back. And that was amazing. So people is willing to share, people is willing to know. And, and that's great. I, I mean, I have had some other experience working here and there, and I haven't, feel, I haven't felt that sense of community that much. It also happens a lot inside of the, um, how to say, creative coding community and all these forums of people sharing knowledge. And, and I guess that's what we're here for. It doesn't make any sense that I store my, my ways of conservation. I mean, all this thing that I was telling you about uh, self-documenting the artwork was nothing that the studio invented ourselves. Keeping records of artworks have been something that has been happening in media or software-based uh, works for a long time. So being able to understand how things could help each other is the best tool. Well, um, if there's no final thoughts, uh, I think we'll conclude and I'll say congratulations to everybody. We made it an hour without mentioning blockchain, which is great. Um, but, um, uh, that's another conversation. I love, I love, I love me some blockchain, but, um, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, I hope everyone uh, listening got a lot of, out of this. Uh, we will be sharing these resources that's uh, fundamental to how we operate. So uh, in, our, in our intentions here uh, at ArxChat is to, to help everybody out. Um, thanks for sharing your expertise. Uh, we'll put the podcast out uh, this coming Friday and uh, the video will be available basically ASAP. Um, Robin, do you have any final um, t- uh, thoughts from the point of view of Arx before we close it out? So I think that this though is... Um... It sounds like I'm an old lady, which I kind of am, but this is the future, right? This stuff's not going away. The point that you guys said about YouTube made me like kind of laugh to myself because you're absolutely right. It could go away in like 10 years. And that's where everyone is throwing stuff right now, including myself. Um, But I think this is all things that we have to consider and think about. So thank you for talking to us and just being thoughtful about how you're talking about it and about how um, you're bringing it up for the community. And Kate's presentation was great. And if you were a, a... attendee to the virtual conference, you can access all those resources, but the ones you guys mentioned, we'll make sure that they are able to be accessed by everyone afterwards. So thanks again for your time. And that's it. I will also point out that uh, there's a great podcast called Art and Obsolescence, which is how uh, I met Sasha. It's put uh, out by Benfino Radden, who's also a time-based media conservator. So um, we'll, uh, we'll include a link to that. And Ben was helpful in uh, uh, connecting, uh, this panel today. So that was, uh, much appreciated. So, uh, with that, stay tuned for the next time, uh, next week or next month, uh, Amanda is going to be hosting something that's going to rock your world. So, um, stay tuned for that. Thanks again for, for listening, everyone. Thank you.